two minutes to say that um, we are very happy to uh, welcome Jorge, of course. And this is the, also the first session of this brand new uh, campus we are putting in place this year. So I propose we applaud the teams that have put this in place. And this is the seventh edition of MIFA campus. And we really wanted this year, with Mexican animation being celebrated, to have Jorge <laughs> as the godfather of this uh, edition. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, so I'm going to be telling a lot of stories. Uh, some of these, some of you might have heard before, but this is like the greatest hits album. They're going to be played differently and better, I think. Uh, so hang in there. It's going to be 55 minutes of talking and then 20 minutes of Q and A. And I go, I go pretty fast, so I apologize if I go too fast. Uh, here we go. All right. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, this is my, my my master class. It's called What a Time to Be Alive. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you all these stories. So uh, growing up, my nickname was Super Macho. And the, the, this nickname, Super Macho, uh, came from my grandfather. Uh, when I was six years old, my grandfather sat me down in Mexico, of course, uh, and he poured two shots of tequila. And I was six, so I was super excited, right? And he said, Jorge or Jorjito, I'm going to tell you what it is to be a man. And when he said that, it was like I could feel in my little baby lips, my mustache start to like start to come out. And he said, Jorge, in Mexico, there are two types of men, the machos and the super machos. <laughs> and when he said that, again, my chest started bubbling. I could feel my chest hair starting to come out. And he said, the machos, they fight everybody. But the super machos, they fight no one. That's how macho they are. <laughs> and I was super excited, right? So I'm like trying to grab the, the, the tequila shot, and he like hits my hand. And he said, Jorge, the machos, they, they're not faithful to their women. They, they cheat on their wives. They even cheat on their mistresses. They have no honor. But the super machos, they're faithful forever. And I was super excited, right? I'm like, grandfather, grandfather, tell me, are you super macho? And he, he grabbed my tequila shot, and he grabbed his tequila shot, and he drank both of them. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not super macho, but you can be. Every day in your life, choices will be in front of you. And you must ask yourself, am I macho or am I super macho? The easy path, the path where everybody goes, those are the machos. You want to go with the hard path, the path where no one's there. And you might be alone, but you'll be super macho by the end of it. And that was it. That became my nickname. So that, that's why I, I used super macho growing up. So of course, <laughs> why should you guys listen to me uh, in an animation festival? So these are the three things uh, that many of you might know from, from myself and my wife, Sandra. Uh, they took seven years, seven years between them, which is kind of crazy. Uh, El Tigre was a show that we had at Nickelodeon. Book of Life was a movie. Guillermo Toro was the producer. Uh, and it all began in 48 uh, years ago. So uh, I was just another kid from Mexico City. Um, this is my drawings when I was seven years old. Already, you can tell I couldn't spell. Uh, but this was my, I was obsessed with Michael Jackson's thriller music video. Uh, I grew up in Mexico City. Uh, I was born in 1975. Uh, Mexico City's incredible, incredible city full of inspiration and, and, and craziness and, and honestly, lots of crime. Uh, and this is my mama uh, back in the day. And of course, when my mom, uh, you know, met my dad, my dad uh, went crazy and after dating four months, they got married. That, that's crazy Mexican man. Uh, so my dad was an architect. My mother uh, was, is very bohemian. Uh, she would play the guitar and she would sing. My father could draw. So to me, growing up, everybody's parents were artists. And you had to pick what kind of artist you wanted to be. So my sister's an artist. I'm an artist. Uh, I was uh, you know, obsessed with pop culture, living in Mexico next to the US. I was very much uh, into you know, Pinocchio and Cowboys and the Hulk and all those things. Uh, and at nine years old, we moved to uh, Tijuana. 
Tijuana is in the border between the US and Mexico. Uh, and at that time, it was the most dangerous city in the world. Uh, and it's a crazy city. It's literally between two, two cultures clashing. It's the last corner of Latin America. Uh, these are my 10-year-old drawings. Still can spell very well. Uh, and Tijuana was everything The Simpsons taught me. Uh, it was crazy. Uh, and these were my comics. I was very into Sergio Aragonés, so this is kind of how I was drawing back then. Uh, this comic is very sad. Uh, he, you know, this ogre marries a woman and then realizes marriage is death. So already at 13, I was questioning the future. So uh, I went to this place called Casa La Cultura, which is like a community art school in Tijuana. Uh, and this is me at 15 years old. This is kind of the comics drawings I was doing. Uh, then I went to this planetarium place and film center, and, and that's kind of where I fell in love with cinema. Uh, and then in 1994, I, I already was dating the, the girl of my dream, Sandra, who ended up uh, getting married. And I beat my father. I proposed two weeks from the day I met her. And uh, she was very smart, and she said no. Uh, so then uh, my, my father said, Jorge, uh, if you like animation, you like cartoons, find the hardest school in the world to go to. Uh, and so if you can get you know, super macho, if you're so macho, find the hardest school in the world. And if you can get in, maybe, maybe, maybe I will let you study this stuff. Uh, and so I went to uh, apply to CalArts at that time. I, I took all my figure drawings. I took all my drawings that I thought I drew to, to please Americans. So I drew Bart Simpson and, and you know, Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse and all this stuff. And then I took a painting portfolio of my paintings. Uh, and oh, let me go back. Ah. And uh, when, when Jules Engel, who's the head of experimental animation program, when he uh, saw my figure drawings, he, it didn't impress him at all. But then when he saw my American drawings, when he saw Bugs Bunny, Bart Simpson, and Mickey Mouse, he said, uh, what, you know, he was Hungarian, so he said, uh, what, what is this shit? Uh, and I said, oh, these are, the, you know, these are the drawings the Americans want to see. And he went drawing by drawing and basically told me, oh, this is poop, uh, this is excrement. Like, he ran out of words, poo poo. Uh, and I remember one, like, the one I was the most proud of, he looked at it like a, like a doctor looking at an x-ray, and he goes, why, why do you poop in my eyes with this? <laughs> And then he said words that stayed with me forever. He said, you're not an artist. You have no voice. You say nothing. Your drawings could have been done by a copy machine. You're saying nothing. And then she, he closed my portfolio and he said, go do something else. Art is not for you. Uh, so I was devastated, right? At 17 years old, devastated. Uh, I walk away and then I accidentally left my painting portfolio because I wanted to see if I could get into uh, painting schools. Uh, and he opened the painting book and this was the painting that I had in there. And he said, hey, sad boy, come back. Uh, <laughs> and he goes, what the, what this? And so I tell him, oh, it's a little painting about this woman who had an affair with a coyote and it's about Mexico and the US. And basically I tell him the whole story of the painting and he starts laughing. And he goes, show me more. So I started showing him all these paintings of things that I loved. And he said, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Why did you not show me this? And I said, because I didn't think that's what you guys wanted to see. And he said, you are stupid. <laughs> this is your voice. Why did you do these? I said, I don't know, because this is the stuff I love. And he said, that. That right there, that's your voice. I'm gonna let you into the school if you do that. If you put that up on the screen, I will be seeing something I haven't seen before. I'm gonna let you into the school. So I went crazy. Uh, I got accepted into the experimental animation program. This is 1994, this is the youngest idea I could find. Uh, and then I met you know, like-minded people like me. Uh, I, it was really, really, I worked so hard when I went there. I realized, uh, you know, for all of you students, I realized that uh, art students are incredible procrastinators. <laughs> they come up with so many excuses to not do the work, right? I need the inspiration, I need the right pencil, the right software, the blah, blah, blah. And, I, you know, video games. So when I was in school, I realized, that's it. That's how I'm going to compete. I'm just going to outwork everybody. And I can't choose how, how much talent I have, but I can choose what I do with my time. So I was the guy in school who like, I would buy video games, like pirate video games, and I would like hand them out to people. <laughs> and like, if there were like party people, I would buy beer and like leave it there and then go and work in my room. So I was like killing my enemies without them knowing them. 
So I, I and I, you know, CalArts was incredible. I, I met lots of my heroes. Uh, Sandra and I kept dating. Uh, she still wouldn't marry me. Uh, so I did my bachelor's degree in 97, master's degree in 2000. This was my first student short at CalArts, style animation. Uh, I did stop motion. Uh, Sandra became sort of my muse. I became obsessed with her. I uh, started doing live action little shorts. Uh, and we, you know, growing up in Tijuana, I was pretty crazy back then. So we got in trouble a lot. Uh, and I learned a lot of lessons. Uh, one time I got arrested and I, I went to jail for something stupid uh, for a few days. And I remember my dad talking to me afterwards. And he, he was obviously upset and angry, but he said something that stayed with me. He said, Jorge, uh, when, when you were born, you were a puma. And every experience you have, it's a, it's a tiger stripe. And these experiences, they can be good and they can be bad, but experiences teach you something. And my dream for you is that before you die, you become a panther because you've experienced everything. So learn from the good and learn from the bad. And so that became a big, a big inspiration. Uh, as I was graduating from school, I worked on this movie called uh, Stuart Little as a CG animator, and it was, it was a terrible experience. Uh, <laughs> I thought I was gonna meet the director, I thought I was gonna meet the writer. Uh, the director had done The Lion King, the writer had written The Sixth Sense, it was M. Night Shyamalan. So I was excited to learn from them, but as a, as a visual effects animator, you never talk to them. <laughs> so I didn't have any of those experiences. So I, I decided when I went back to school, I have to focus on story and design. And so I shifted my, my, all my energy. Uh, this is a CalArts graduation. I finished my final film at CalArts. It was an eight minute CG film. I hated CG, but I decided that's what a super macho would do, right? The easy path would be to do 2D or stop motion. I'm gonna do the hardest thing that no one else was doing back then. So I did a, a CG short. And it won the student Emmy, and it opened a lot of doors everywhere. And by the way, uh, Carmelo is the inspiration for Book of Life, Wooden Dolls and on Day of the Dead. Uh, and so they, at that point, an agent signed me. He said, I'm going to send you all over Hollywood to pitch a movie, uh, write a movie. So uh, I wrote uh, Book of Life, like a, a treatment for Book of Life. And every studio in town rejected me. They said, you're some dumb kid out of school. Just because you won an Emmy doesn't mean you can direct the movie. Uh, and I was told endless times. No one wants to see a film about dead Mexicans. This is the year 2001, by the way. So uh, what happened was I couldn't find work uh, at that point. I would get offers to be a CG animator, but I didn't want to follow that path. I wanted to make my own stuff. And so I got a pirate version of uh, Flash, this old animation program. And we just did a little short. Sandra uh, did the voices. I worked on it with another friend. I put it up online. So after spending three years working on a giant short, I spent maybe three weeks on this short, put it online, it got 20,000 views in one night, which for today's uh, metrics, it'd be like two million views in one night. And so Sony Pictures immediately called me and said, we wanna buy your short, we wanna sponsor your visa, and we want, if you did this with zero resources, what can you do with resources? And they said, who wrote it? I did it, who directed it? I did it, who animated it? I did, who did the voices? I did. So I said, well, we'll pay you to do all those things. And it was amazing, right? So we started working on the short. It was super crude. You guys can find it on YouTube. Uh, we, got, we got married. I, I proposed to Sandra in the year 2000. Uh, we had a crazy day at that wedding a year later. Uh, and then after that, I, I said, oh my god, this is the greatest country in the world. They support you to, to make your own work. Uh, and, and we really felt like we made it. And three months after the wedding, they canceled the show. <laughs> but what that did was amazing. So, because they canceled the show at Sony, they, they called us in the morning and they said, uh, mandatory meeting you know, at 3 p.m., everybody come in. So we all go in and they said, we're canceling the division, we're shutting everything down, uh, we're gonna delete all the hard drives. And then the Sony executive said, go to your office or go to your desk and take whatever you think you deserve. And everybody was crying and angry and kicking the floor. And I was the only guy with like a giant smile. And I ran to my office and I called Sandra. We lived next door to the studio. And I said, Sandra, bring two shopping carts. We deserve everything. <laughs> and this is what a good Mexican wife Sandra is. No questions asked. She goes, got it, click. <laughs> Shows up with these two giant shopping carts and we took chairs, computers, tablets. <laughs> We were like Haitian refugees walking out of there. And uh, that's how we started our studio. 
So from something bad, something good always comes, right? So we said, all right, bring it, Hollywood. Uh, so we did tons, tons of freelance. I was working crazy hours. Uh, I was the guy who you hired to do one design, and I would turn in 10 in color. I just basically over-delivered. And to me, it was the more I do stuff, the better I get. So if you're paying me, I'm going to get better. And I'm going to use your studio money to just become a better artist. So I, was, I never took it personal when they didn't use my stuff. Uh, at that point, we get called in by Disney. Hey, we want to do a show with you guys. We saw your internet cartoon, so we did this thing called Pepe the Bull. Immediately canceled. It was too, too super macho uh, for them. Uh, but we got hired on another show called The Buzz on Maggie, which was the first Flash show done at Disney. Uh, I tried to sneak in as many Mexican things as I could, uh, and then they canceled it. I like to believe it was because of that. Uh, and we said, all right, ride or die, let's keep making stuff. Uh, so we did three more shows, and they all died in development uh, at Disney and Warner Brothers. So at that point, I was starting to worry. Uh, but then, on the fourth pilot we did, we did El Tigre. So we did the El Tigre in 2004. This was a, a labor of love. Uh, huge, you know, first flash show at Nickelodeon. Uh, that was our creator's picture. We were super happy. Usually I design all the men, and Sandra designs all the women. Uh, we collaborate with all the villains. Uh, and El Tigre was this sort of crazy experience we had, uh, all inspired by our growing up in Mexico, growing up in Tijuana. I love spaghetti westerns, so I love the idea of, of morality being gray. And this is the show in a nutshell, right? A kid whose dad is a superhero, grandpa's a supervillain. He has to decide what he wants to do. As a kid, my dad was an architect, so he could draw, so I thought he had superpowers. My grandfather was in the Mexican army, which is kind of like being a supervillain. And I adored both of them. And my aunts would grab my cheeks and would say, when you grow up, are you going to be like your dad or like your grandpa? So that's basically where the show came from. Uh, you know, Good or bad, it's all in the family. And we, we went crazy. We basically did a lot of stuff. We got a lot of Mexican culture in there, uh, inspired by everything, everything around us, everything we grew up with. Uh, it became a huge inspiration for the show. Already, because Book of Life had been written, uh, the villain in, 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 the book, in the villain in El Tigre is basically the daughter of the two gods in the Book of Life. So it was all connected. Uh, we did lots and lots of crazy designs, worked with incredible crew. This was kind of a crazy show. Uh, and we only did 26 episodes. Uh, they viewed it. It was a huge hit. Uh, it, was, it was everywhere at that time. Uh, people started dressing up like the characters, that Sandra and Frida. Uh, we would get pictures uh, from everywhere, all these comic cons. It was kind of amazing. Uh, you know, McDonald's did toys, they did video games, they did pirate DVDs, any awards. It won the best show that year, it won character design. Sandra was the first Mexican woman to win an Emmy for her character designs. And then she, she, like, she would look down on me for a year. And, say, <laughs> and she would say, you are not up to par. So I had to win uh, my own Emmy to be able to look at her in the eye as an equal. So the year after, it won five Emmys. So this is the most Emmys a show has ever won with one season. And again, we felt, we made it. We made Hollywood. We have conquered you. And they canceled the show. <laughs> so then uh, Dreamers calls me up and they said, oh, we, we heard you have a Day of the Dead movie idea. And I had pitched it right out of school to them, uh, you know, seven Emmys ago. Uh, and they had told me it was amateurish and terrible. I took the same exact document, the exact document. And back then, they would write all the coverage, right? Like, this is juvenile, blah, 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 two morose, blah, blah, blah. I ripped the page. I wrote a new cover page, put a new date, almost as a dare and as a joke. I submitted the same exact document. And uh, I got it back the next day, and they were like, this is brilliant. This is original, <laughs> unlike anything we've ever read. So I go to DreamWorks. I worked there for a whole year. And then uh, the movie was going great. And then at some point, they said, Jorge, we, in order for the movie to move forward, it, these are all the things they said. Uh, characters can't be made out of wood. Uh, the main character can't die. There can't be any bullfighting. It can't take place in Mexico. And we want the movie to be a hip hop salsa reggaeton musical set in New York. And we want to pair you up with, and I remember they, they read the name, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda. <laughs> and this is, you know, 2008, this is before Hamilton, before In the Heights, before any of the things that Lynn is famous for now. So at that, when they said that, I remember 
like just time stopped and I, I could feel the tombs of my ancestors all over Mexico shaking and their spirits traveled through the land and crossed the border with no passports and they went, when they went into me and the most powerful word in Hollywood came out of me, no. And everybody like st stood back and I, was, I said, no, I quit. And they're like, you can't quit. And I said, no, this is not what I want to make. And this is not my movie. And good luck making uh, your hip-hop salsa New York reggaeton musical. And I, and I even said, uh, and you tell Lynn manuel Miranda, you tell her, good luck with her career. <laughs> and so I, I, I walked out of there. And it was, it was a very, very powerful moment, uh, kind of a, a moment where I realized the macho path would have been said, yeah, I'll do whatever you guys want. But the super macho path was no. So it's almost better to not do it and, and not have it come alive in a version that's horrible than to make a, a, a sad version of it. Because what happens if you make something crappy and it's successful? Then you're cursed forever, right? So they canceled it. Uh, Sandra was pregnant, right? We're very dramatic in our lives. They're like, oh, I'm unemployed, we have no money. Let's make a baby. <laughs> So we go back to Disney. Uh, we, we, you know, Disney had broken our heart many times. We do this, this show called Carmen Looks Expelled about this rebellious Latina girl. Uh, it was pretty crazy. And then Disney goes, hey, what if she's not Latina? And what if she's not rebellious? <laughs> and we said, well, what if we don't work here? And so they canceled it. Uh, and at this point, Luca's born. And I had a talk with my dad. And my, my, my dad was like, you know, sat me down, just like my grandfather. And he said, okay, Jorge, you had a baby. What are you going to do now? And I said, well, Dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be more conservative. I'm going to you know, do things because now I have to support a little baby. I'm going to do things that are probably easier. I'm going to do things that are more stable. And he stood back and he said, Jorge, did, did I raise a coward? And you know, Mexico, coward is, is the C word for us. Uh, and, and he said, are you, are you stupid in your life? Every time you take chances, that's when the good thing happens. If you stop taking chances, you're going to blame your family. And you're going to use your family as an excuse to not do those things. And you're going to resent them. So no, you're going to take even more chances. Because now there's more at stake. So it was, it was one, a slap in the face for my dad that really helped me. Uh, so I went back to Nickelodeon after they killed El Tigre. Uh, I pitched a new show, went into development. It was going great. It was super over the top. I love Street Fighters. I was very much inspired by fighting games. Uh, and then Nickelodeon, they canceled it because uh, it, it, the World Wrestling Entertainment, right, the big wrestling company in the U.S., basically liked the show. And they said, we want to we wanna take the show and have all his characters be our wrestlers. And I didn't want to do that. So they, they killed it. Uh, and I, at that point, it was like, oh, no, we need to eat. Uh, so I went to Warner Brothers, uh, and I worked on Madden. And, and basically, at that time, Warner Brothers uh, was doing crazy stuff. So I, I love Mad Magazine. So they, they let me kind of do my crazy take on a bunch of their, their properties. I did a bunch of shorts. Uh, it was really, really fun. I got to do make fun of Street Fighter. Uh, I, I pitched my own version of, of Batman. Uh, <laughs> It didn't go anywhere, but they, they thought it was really funny. Uh, and then I started painting to relax. Uh, a lot of painting. I, I, I love uh, folk art painting. So it was a weird moment. We were like, well, now what? And then, out of nowhere, Real Effects Animation, a small studio in Dallas, approached me and they said, hey, we heard you quit at DreamWorks. Uh, we heard you quit this giant movie because they didn't want to do what you wanted to do. We'll do what you want to do. Uh, we don't have a, you know, a gigantic budget like DreamWorks has. We have a very small budget but we'll let you write it, and we'll let you direct it, and we'll support you. So I'm, I am forever eternally thankful to Real Effects for, for supporting Book of Life. Uh, so we moved to Texas. Right at this point, the studio had never made a theatrical film. I had never directed a theatrical movie. And it was very ironic to me. I said, I had to leave Mexico to make Mexican things, and now I have to leave Hollywood to make a Hollywood movie. So we, we moved to Texas. We got one year to design the movie and write the script. So we just went to work, we got to hire a production designer, we got to hire an art director. Sandra and I went nuts with all the characters. Uh, La Muerte, which is a character that we really, really struggled with. We got in giant fights, we almost got divorced. Uh, I, you know, I, I wanted the hat to be even bigger and have more candles. Uh, this was sort of the compromise between the two of us, and, and she was right. Uh, the villain was also really hard. Uh, you know, 
we draw, we draw really fat and uh, not fat, really uh, flat and graphic. And for a lot of CG people, it's really hard for them to to go. We can do this in CG. So what we ended up doing was uh, our production designer hired sculptors. So we would give them our flat drawings, and they would make a sculpture, and then I would give it to the modelers, and I would go. You know, if a drunk guy in El Salvador can make my drawing into a sculpture, you can fucking make a model. So that's basically how that started. Uh, so we went crazy. We designed a ton of stuff. We started designing the world. Uh, you know, this is I don't know, 2010 at this point. Uh, so we're working like crazy. Land of the Dead, the Land of the Remembered, uh, Land of the Forgotten. It was an incredible time. Uh, we did early presentation work. We basically did these nine paintings, and they said, all right, we want you to pitch them. Uh, to pitch the movie to your dream producer. So of course, at that time, and uh, it will always be my dream producer, I said, I want to pitch it to Guillermo del Toro. Uh, and so Guillermo del Toro, uh, we tried, and he turned me down 15 times, one five. And when I say he turned me down 15 times, and we're friends, so I can tell you guys the story. Uh, he would agree to meet me and then not show up. Or I would show up and I would see him look at me, get in his car and drive off. It was like, the, if we were dating, this would be the, the, the most cruel dating experience. <laughs> it, was, it would be like showing up to the restaurant and they tell you, oh, the other person left and here's the bill. That's, that's what it felt like. Uh, and so finally, after 15 times, he said, okay, bring him to my house. I want to, I want to say no to him to his face. So we go to his, at that time he had two houses in LA, one where he lived with uh, his wife and uh, his daughters, and then one where he lived with all his amazing, amazing collections. So this is Bleak House, where he has all this beautiful, incredible art and life-size statues of, you know, uh, basically Edgar Allan Poe. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, Harry Housen, all these. It's just incredible. So I got to pitch him the Book of Life, and this was the worst pitch of all time. So if all you have heard this, I'm going to tell the story again because I get, I get to relive that magical moment. So we drive to this house, they told me, you have 30 minutes to pitch your movie. So I've been pract literally practicing for months. I had it to the beat of uh, this thing. We show up, he wasn't very friendly when we showed up. Uh, he gives us a tour of this house, so we're very overwhelmed. So by the time we're done with the tour, there's no space to put our sculptures and our paintings. So we make a horrible decision and we say, oh, we'll put it outside in the, in the yard and we'll pitch to you outside. So we go outside. And it was August in Los Angeles, so it was incredibly hot. Uh, I'm a big guy, he's a big guy, so we're already drenched in sweat. Uh, because when we go outside, uh, in my head, I, I still think I have 30 minutes, uh, I, I, you know, I get ready and I, I summon my ancestors. I say, ancestors, give me the strength to pitch the greatest pitch of all time. And as soon as I open my mouth, Guillermo goes, Gordo, five minutes. I'm like, five minutes? What happened to the five minutes? So I'm like, okay, I'm sisters, we can do this. We can, so I'm cutting in my head the, the presentation. I'm like, okay, five minutes, five minutes. Ancestors, give me the strength. Again, I opened my mouth, and it was, it was like a movie. Uh, my people betrayed me. And, and there were like five leaf blower guys in, in the mansion next door. And it's like they saw my face, they saw my mouth open, and they were like, let's do it. So this insane sound starts coming. So I yell at Guillermo, Guillermo, should we wait till they finish? And he looks at me with his beautiful blue eyes, and he goes, no, no, four minutes. So worst pitch of all time. I basically, I, he was laughing at me, he wasn't laughing at the pitch. Disaster. Uh, it was. It really was the worst. My worst nightmare times a thousand. We go inside. The pitch is over. One of the producers left. No one has seen him since. He was so embarrassed. It was terrible. Uh, so we go in. We sit down. And and I remember sitting and looking at him and apologizing. I'm so sorry. That was that was such a terrible pitch. And he goes, Gordo, that was a terrible pitch. That was the shittiest pitch I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so I, I stand up to say thank you, and he just goes, sit down. He goes, Gordo, I have two daughters. We would watch your cartoons on Saturday morning with El Tigre and your mad shorts. I know who you are. I know your love of Mexico. I know your love of our culture. I know your sense of humor, and I know your art. 
of course I'm gonna produce your movie. So I stand up, he stands up, I hug, right? I like I hug him, and I believe at that moment our liquids combine. <laughs> And, and our, our, our DNA, like, like, I got a little bit of his superpowers. And then he pushes me away, like, ah! and he goes, Gordo, uh, did you write the script? This is very important. He goes, if you didn't write the script, you're not a real director. Right? Harsh words. And I said, no, no, I, uh, I wrote the script with my co-writer from El Tigre. Uh, let me run to my car. I'll bring it. So I run to my car, open the trunk. I, I find my script. We've gone to a Mexican wedding. At the Mexican wedding, they gave us uh, tequila bottles. <laughs> Mexican, sorry. Uh, tequila bottles to take home. The bottle broke. The, the, the script was covered. It was, literally, it was like used toilet paper with tequila. So I grab the script, and I'm blowing on it. I, I run to him, and I hand him this like brick of wet uh, paper. And he grabs it with his beautiful, meaty hands, and, and he lifts it like, like the monkey in the Lion King with a baby, right? <laughs> and he smells it, and he goes, Gordo, this is a good script. <laughs> and that was it. Guillermo became the, the, the producer. Uh, and I was like, is this real? What's happening? Uh, and and he, he made all, honestly, he made all my dreams come true. So we worked really hard. Uh, at that point, 20th Century Fox became a partner. We went crazy. We started designing everything. Again, doing maquettes, uh, doing test shots, figuring out what the movie was going to look like. I loved art of books. I wanted the movie to look like the art and the art of books. So we, what you see in the top is a painting. What you see in the bottom is still from the movie. We tried getting closer and closer. And then we just ran out of money. But that was the intent from the beginning. So when we ran out of money, we hadn't done the land of the dead. Uh, so at that point, we had to figure out, well, how much money is left? And so our production, uh, our art director, Paul Sullivan, uh, we, we sat down, we broke it down, and, and we basically built the whole land of the dead with very few pieces. Basically this and this. That's it. That's all the land of the dead. People didn't believe us. So we had to show them this test breakdown of how we did that. So this is one of the biggest, most important moments in the movie. Our, our, our hero who has just committed suicide goes to the land of the dead and is reunited with his family. And what you guys saw, those you know, 17 pieces of, of geometry, that was the whole land of the dead. It's all you know, lighting and texturing, comping. That was it. <laughs> but that, that's the magic of animation. Right? We tell lies and people want to believe them. So movie comes out, huge, crazy experience. I don't even remember the premiere. Like that's how overwhelmed I was. Uh, Danny Trejo got to kiss me. I was super excited. Uh, it was a crazy, crazy moment. Uh, the movie came out all over the world. Uh, for some reason, it's called uh, The Legend of Manolo in France. Uh, don't know why. Uh, and it, it kind of blew up. Uh, they did an art book. They did an album. Uh, and it, the movie made $100 million on the box office, but then on video, this is when Blu-ray still sold, it exploded on Blu-ray. It did incredible on Blu-ray. Uh, it got you know, a lot of nominations. We didn't get an Oscar nomination, uh, but we got a you know, Golden Glove, Critics' Choice, the Annie Awards. It only won one award for character design, and we could not have been happier. Uh, and at that point, I was broken. Uh, I was just so tired. So again, I started painting again. Uh, they hired me to do a mural in, in, in Dallas. Uh, and then El Pollo Loco, this chain of uh, Mexican food saw, and they had me do another uh, mural. And then I had all this leftover paint, so I just started painting. And I kind of went crazy, just painting pop culture, all the things Jules Engels told me not to draw. I started doing them. Uh, and I kind of went nuts, uh, just painting and painting and painting. Uh, they invited me to do an art show. They asked for seven paintings. And I did 57. And it was pretty nuts. So I would do like five of these a night uh, while I was working during the day. And it was like therapy. The, I'm proud of the Trump one because people wanted to kill me when I did that one, uh, which is great. Then I had an art show. Uh, NPR is like this big American uh, uh, company that is like sort of promoting the, the, not only the news, but the arts. And they really got behind the show. Uh, and then I did a book and I became a painter. Uh, and we just kept painting. And then we started running into our characters at conventions or all over Mexico where people would take pictures with them. And then we started getting pictures from all over the world of people dressing up as the characters at, at fan conventions and all these events, at weddings. It was, it was remarkable. And it was, the best part was it was usually from outside of Mexico. Like We would get a lot of stuff from Mexico, but it, all of it was coming from everywhere. It seemed like the movie had found its own 
thing outside. So India, everywhere. It was kind of kind of amazing. Uh, people started, you know, getting married, dressed as the characters. It was kind of insane. Uh, Camila uh, Cabello, Cabello, who's the big singer, dressed up as La Marte. And then we started getting uh, pictures of tattoos. Uh, our characters started showing up, and, and people really love uh, this character. It was kind of amazing. And then there was an illegal musical in Mexico, which to me, that was, that was better than an Oscar, right? <laughs> So they did this giant, you know, at this point, it was, it was, the movie had become its own thing. It was kind of, kind of amazing. Uh, then we got hired by Microsoft to do a, a Super Bowl commercial. And we made more money making the commercial than making the movie. It was, it was pretty crazy. And we had to pretend we did the movie in these service computers. <laughs> and of course, we were like, yes, yes, we did, absolutely. Uh, and the, the commercial you know, aired everywhere. We started getting fan art people connecting our characters, El Tigre, and, and again, Book of Life changed our lives. Uh, then I went to Google, uh, I did a, a, a Mexican wrestling VR thing. Uh, at this point, I, I realized emotion is the best effect in animation. You don't need software for that, you need humanity for that. Uh, so I, I, I love Mexican wrestling, and I remember going to a bullfight as a little kid, and I hate bullfights, uh, but this was a bullfight where the bull hit a guy and his leg went flying. And I didn't know that he had a prosthetic leg. And the audience, everybody reacted crazily. And I remember my dad uh, telling me, imagine what that guy can do with one leg, Jorge. What are you going to do with two legs? So my dad was always giving me these crazy lessons. So I got really into athletes with one limb or missing limbs. Uh, and so we started uh, making this short about this Mexican wrestler who's missing a leg. And it was really about uh, me coming to terms with autism. So I'm on the autism spectrum. My son is on the autism spectrum. And early on when he was diagnosed, I started feeling like I, I'm not complete. There's something missing because I'm not like other people. And so that basically was the, the, what the short was about. And then this Mexican wrestler who, was, uh, who, who couldn't compete with others because he was missing a leg, uh, was facing people that were younger than him, people that were stronger than him. Uh, and so we did this, this crazy little short. And in the climax of the short, he keeps failing until he realizes my family is not my weakness. My family is my strength. And so his son jumps in the ring and becomes his leg. And that's how he wins. And that, that basically was what happened to me uh, when I realized my family was my strength. Uh, so Son of Jaguar is done. Uh, and the Emmy nominations, it doesn't win. Uh, so then what? Life keeps going on. Uh, all of a sudden, I started getting cast in different things as a Mexican wrestler. So I, I started doing a lot of voices. 2018, we go to Netflix, uh, series and feature animation, which is a crazy time. Uh, I, was, I got a lucha mask, and I said, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Uh, there was this crazy pizza party with a lot of famous directors and famous uh, creators of, of cartoons. I can't name them because a lot of them didn't go there because they didn't think it was real. Uh, they sat me down at this pizza party and they said, pitch us something you don't think you can get made anywhere but here. And so I remembered I love Mesoamerican folklore and Mesoamerican myths, uh, you know, from the Aztecs and the Mayans, but it's a very, very powerful history that we have, but it's very overwhelming. Uh, and as a kid, I got taken to the Museo, Museo de Antropología, which is a big museum in, in Mexico City, and it really affected me. Uh, and I decided, you know what? All the myths I grew up with, women were the victims, or they were the prize, or, or they were the hag, they were never the heroes. And so I said, fuck that. Uh, mythology and folklore represent the views of their time. We, us, we are the myth makers now. We are the folklore writers. And we should make things that reflect the views of our times. So it's my birthright. I'm going to hack my mythology. And I'm going to tell a story that I think we should have told. And I'm going to try to honor my wife, and I'm going to try to honor my mother, and I'm going to try to honor my sister. And that's where Maya and the Three uh, came from. So that was our, our, our first Netflix baby. Uh, you know, COVID hit, so we were working from home. Uh, these are shitty sketches that started everything. Uh, the, literally, the, that's the first sketch that happened. That's how close we get to the final model looking like original sketches. And by the way, the, the secret to this, and my, my wife Sandra always says it, is you became a director to protect our designs. 
because when the director is the designer, no one can tell him to make the legs shorter or the eyes smaller or the nose is too big because you're the director. <laughs> <laughs> so I got away with murder, uh, and I really wanted to honor Sandra, and I really wanted to honor uh, when I met her, and, and obviously honor the culture. So we just went crazy. We, this, Sandra, again, designing uh, most of the female characters. Uh, I designed most of the male characters. We started voicing characters. Uh, Sandra started voicing the queen. Uh, I basically wrote shots for Diego Luna, because I have a giant man crush on him. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and we, you know, we, we went nuts. And we got to do our version, just like El Tigre was our version of superheroes and Book of Life was our version of Day of the Dead, Maya was our version of Mesoamerica. Uh, and so we did a lot of stuff. And obviously, you know, Sandra's designs are very elegant uh, and beautiful. Uh, when I design women, they kind of look like this. So this is why I don't design women a lot. Uh, so Maya and the three, uh, again, from sketch to final, we really try to keep that thing that happens in sketches, which is there's a spontaneity that I think a lot of times get lost uh, in the process. Uh, and it was a classic hero's journey, you know, a lot of spin. I love Lord of the Rings. So the question I would ask is, what if in Lord of the Rings, the ring was a 15-year-old Aztec girl? And what if instead of someone throwing the ring into the volcano, what if she chose to sacrifice herself? So that was basically Maya. Uh, so it was three movies, nine episodes. Uh, Gustavo Santalaya was our composer. It came out, and, you know, again, with a lot of support all over the world. People started dressing like the characters. Fan art people uh, really took the characters and made them their own. It was kind of amazing. Uh, again, from all over the world, right? Uh, people started dressing up like the characters. We haven't gotten that many tattoos yet, because I think these characters are really hard to draw. Uh, but it's been, it's been amazing. Murals have been popping up everywhere with, with the characters. Uh, so seven Annie Award nominations. Uh, it won you know, two, but it's the big one. It won the best show. Uh, and then big, big thing back then, uh, people were worried about the subject matter. Like, is Mesoamerica something that kids all over the world will want to see and parents will want to see? Well, it was top 10 in 55 countries all over the world. Uh, it was number one in in Italy and Thailand, and it did, it did really well, really well in countries where uh, there was an appreciation for, for Mexico. So it really traveled. Uh, it won four out of five Emmys. I stabbed myself uh, in the eye with the Emmy. Uh, so I feel like I bled for this. <laughs> it was worth it. Uh, and again, people started drawing the characters from before with a new character, so thank you, Maya. I started doing art toys just for fun. I started painting murals. I uh, started designing festival posters. Uh, I started doing album covers. El uh, Tigre almost came back in Nickelodeon. Uh, I started doing murals for, for kids during the pandemic. Uh, then I did a music video at Netflix uh, called American Citizen. I encourage you all, if you, if you find it, where we basically got to do snippets of all over the world. Uh, France has a, references to the French New Wave and to Amelie, which we love. Uh, but yeah, so that, that music video was, was super fun. It won an Emmy. Uh, and then I was going to do a Simpsons opening, but then the writer's strike happened, and that's not going forward anymore. But all these were for my Simpsons uh, horror opening. Uh, and then Guillermo del Toro said, Gordo. Let's go to NEC 2023. So of course, uh, I, Marcel, I will forever be uh, thankful. He, he, the way he convinced me to do it was he said, uh, Jorge, is there a Mexican artist that you would recommend to do the poster? And I was like, uh, I know one, me. <laughs> So that, that's how it happened. Uh, we did the poster. You know, all the references to all the things that I love are here. So what am I working on now at Netflix Animation? Uh, I'm, this is my new film that I'm working on right now. Again, I love Street Fighter. So this movie is basically a Street Fighter movie, but not Street Fighter. And it's about a little Mexican chihuahua dog who wants to be a Mexican wrestler. And he enters this World Cup tournament of fighting. And there's going to be fighters from all over the world. So he's going to fight tigers and panthers and monkeys and jaguars. And he's this little dog. And it's about you know, the, the, the underdog that is Latin America competing with the world. So I'm working with Gabriel Iglesias, this is a very funny comedian, uh, Fluffy. Uh, we are knee deep in it. Some of the people, in, obviously, they're all wearing masks. But I've been very lucky, and other directors and creators are helping me uh, with the story, just giving their input, giving advice. So uh, Alex Hirsch, 
uh, Mike Rianda, Alex Hirsch from Gravity Falls, Mike Rianda from uh, Mitchell's Versus the Machines, Chris Williams from uh, you know, Nimona and Big Hero 6 and, and the Sea Beast. All of them are help, helping me out. Uh, it's, been, it's been a crazy experience. I, we can't show you much of it because it's super, super personal. If you go to my Instagram, I've been posting some, uh, some characters that are not the main characters. Uh, but basically, this is what the, the world's going to look like. It's pretty crazy. Uh, and there's more. Uh, I'm doing my first ever adult animation limited series with Netflix. It's in pilot right now, and it's fucking crazy. Uh, I saw Gandhi's Primal. And I said, I want to do my primal. So it, it's going to be very intense. And then I'm doing a brand new limited series that takes place in the Maya and Book of Life universe. So a lot of reincarnated characters are coming back. Uh, and it's pretty crazy. So that one's just in development. Uh, and is this the end? Yes, this is the end. <laughs> so uh, thank you, guys. Uh, good luck to all of you. Good luck on all your, your stuff. All right, so I told you 55 minutes, it was 45 minutes. <laughs> so now we have 30 minutes for the Q&A. So I don't know how we're doing the Q&A. Is there gonna be a mic? Or you guys just wanna yell the questions? We're the first, uh, the first pr presentation to do this. I can yell if you want. All right, let's, let's do yelling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I will not yell. Hi. I am, I am called Manuel. I am producer from Peru. I am very grateful for your presentation. Uh, just first, before my question, I wanted to note I thought there were sound effects during your talk about the worst speech ever, but actually it was the thunder. So I think you're maybe Tlaloc, Tlaloc reincarnated. I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was very funny. <laughs> Yeah, I heard uh, the rain come yes. at the very dramatic moment. Yes, like, yes, oh, yes, wow. yes. I thought it was sound effects. Anyway, um, I just wanted to say uh, the experience of Maya was very interesting to me because in Peru we are trying to do stuff about uh, our culture, our ancient culture, and a lot, of, a lot of people tell us Incas are boring, you know? Incas are, are, are sad, Incas are serious, they cannot... One guy even told me Incas do not make jokes. Why do you, why do you make a funny story about Incas, you know? And my question was, how did you manage to take the Mayan, Aztec, Inca universe that is so, you know, square, like in the, in the schools, when they teach us this history, it's very, um, uh, how do you say, idealized, it's very far away. You do not have like an emotional connection to that uh, period. How do you connect with it? One, one thing I, I think about, for example, for the Incas is the landscapes, like the places where they build their buildings, that, that inspires us for our movies. But that may be a hint for us to create our stories, but how was your process to humanize that period that is so far away? That, uh, that is an awesome question. Thank um, you. So cult culture, where we're from, is something that, if you're not careful, will crush you. Right? Culture is a boulder. So as artists, if you try to carry the culture, it will smash you down. So what we figured out early on was you don't carry the culture. You get on top of the boulder and you walk on top of it, right? So don't feel like you have to define your culture. You only have to define your version of the culture. So we talk about enchiladas, right? This Mexican dish. Everybody cooks them differently and they're all authentic. There's not one right way to cook enchiladas. So that's how I, I've always approached culture. Mesoamerica, right, the Aztecs, the Mayans, is such an a ancient and, and stoic and serious, right? So as a kid, you're told, like, the, ah, the Spaniards came and murdered and butchered and raped, and that's where we're from, right? Like, that's basically what you're told as a kid. Dad was Spain, and he raped mom, which was Mesoamerica, and the children are us. So that's a very difficult thing to grasp in Latin America. For us, early on, we decided, all right, what are the things that people are really upset about and disgusted about the culture? So for us, with the Aztecs, whenever I would bring up Aztec culture to my friends who were not Mexican, and some Mexicans too, the first thing they would say, ugh, 
didn't they sacrifice people? Right? That's the most negative thing. So I said, that's it. Let's grab the thing that everybody's afraid of, the thing that disgusts them, the thing that they think is awful, and let's make a movie about that. And I realized sacrifice is universal. Everybody sacrifices themselves for their job, for the people they love, for their families, for their beliefs. Your whole life is a sacrifice, right? People die in the army, people die believing in something bigger than themselves. A lot of religions are about sacrifice. And so we said, let's make this sacrifice mean something different. So in my end of three, it really is about the gods want to sacrifice a person, and in the end, the person sacrifices themselves. So that's how we made it universal. Uh, when we talked about the culture, we, early on we decided we will never use the word Aztec, we will never use the word Maya, we will never use the word Inca, because when you do that, you are now locked into the culture and you will never please anybody. Nothing can ever be authentic enough because the schools are always fighting. Right? There's a Spanish version of the conquest, there's a Mexican version of the conquest, there's a Central American version of the conquest. Within the countries, there's different schools of thought. You can never please those people. It's impossible. So we decided, hey, just like Greek mythology, just like medieval mythology, just like Chinese mythology, Indian mythology, filmmakers take liberties and do their versions. That's what we're going to do. So that, that was our approach to it. And then the, the last thing I'll say about the, the culture part of it is if you make something that can only be understood by the people of your country, I believe you failed. It can't just be for your people. It has to be for the whole world. So early on when we were pitching stuff, we were always told, wait, 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 explain this, explain the culture. And then we would explain it and they go, oh, this is just for people like you. This is not for all of us. And that is negative. And so when we looked at books and movies and albums of all our favorite writers and directors, especially the early work, you realize people are telling stories about where they're from and people are telling personal stories, but they are universal. And they're universal in their themes. So for example, my favorite movie is Seven Samurai. I've never been to Japan. I don't speak Japanese. But the story of a dying breed of warriors defending ungrateful farmers from bandits and dying for something they believe in, that could take place in the Mexican Revolution, that could play, take place in any culture at any time. So it's universal. By the way, it takes place in Japan. So the way we treat culture is the culture is the canvas, but the story has to work by itself on a personal, emotional, universal way. And that's how we treat Mexico. So whenever I pitch, I go, hey, this is about a princess who defies her parents, goes on this journey, teams up with warriors from other cultures. In the end, she realizes it's up to her to die to save humanity. By the way, it takes place in Mesoamerica. Right? It's never in Mesoamerica. Never start with the culture. Start with the characters. Start with the emotion. So that, that's how we treat culture. But it's really hard. But awesome question. Thank you. Um, I'm Cami Garcia. I'm from Mexico City. Uh, I'm a student. I just graduated uh, animation. And I wanted to ask you, because yesterday uh, I went to a, a party event for Mexicans in animation. And I was talking to a lot of people uh, how it's been growing recently. We were invited to these. We were getting recognized. Uh, but uh, a lot of people in the industry, uh, I talked to older people, new, newer people, we feel like the industry in Mexico is still very like divided in little bubbles, like Guadalajara, Mexico City. Uh, it's not as unified as, for example, France with Annecy, and like they have so much support from the government, and we kind of don't have that in Mexico yet. Uh, obviously, we have people like you, Guillermo, Cuaron, who have put Mexico on the map, and we really thank you for all you've done and the amazing work you created. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you, how do you think we as a community of Mexican animators, new and experienced, can start to unify our community uh, more to be like France, for example, and uh, in our own way, to, so we can have more stories uh, like yours and Guillermo's like reach uh, the mainstream and be picked up by Netflix. How do you think which steps can we take 
to get to other countries are in their animation industry? So I, that's an awesome question. Uh, so I, I'm of the generation where there was zero animation in Mexico, and there was zero, very little unity at all. So what I'm seeing now is 10 times what I had. So it, obviously, um, from my view, this is the best it's ever been. So for you guys, and you go, well, this is not enough. We want more? That's great. Uh, and I think you, the way this works, honestly, is you support each other, right? So you support, help those under you and help those next to you to go up. And you create a community by you know, doing talks and doing collaborative projects. When someone gets a job, you tell all the other people that that job is happening. Uh, I think a lot of Mexican talent is, has left Mexico and is leaving Mexico because there's no opportunities. Just like Latin America, the, there's a overwhelming <laughs> uh, garden of talent, but just not enough water for this talent to grow, so everybody has to go somewhere else. And I see that slowly changing, but I do believe um, putting work, collective work, and, and putting shorts up, and putting pilots up, and you know, pixelatel, and pitching, come to Annecy, and pitching, this is a process, it's a, it's a marathon. And I worry a little bit with a lot of uh, animation students, and by the way, I'm the worst example of this, but a lot of ex animation students put a uh, pressure on themselves that when they graduate, they should have their own show or their own movie. That's very rare, and that's very unrealistic and unhealthy pressure to put on yourself. Uh, almost everybody has worked in TV shows and movies before they get that opportunity, including Guillermo del Toro and, and Cuaron and, and, and me, but this idea that you, you have to be a director, you have to be a, a showrunner, is too much pressure. That's like if you're in sports, you're like, I have to win the World Cup, or I'm a failure. Like, that's crazy. So uh, I really believe we're in a golden time where, uh, because of a post-COVID era, if your work is good, you should be able to work anywhere in the world. And that's new. So those opportunities, if Mexico doesn't give them to you, adios Mexico. <laughs> but the opportunity, the true strength, the true power of, of your talent, that's you. And no one can take that away from you. So you're the talent. And now what do you do with the talent? And where do you take the talent? So I think helping each other. Uh, but it is, it is a difficult time right now, just because the industry is taking a, the way our industry works is we go left, right, left, right. And right now we're going really extreme this way, but it's going to swing back. And when it swings back, people who are ready are going to be able to take advantage of that. But I think you're, you're going to be fine. Uh, Hello. I'm Philip. I I teach in the land of K-pop, and I teach film students. And I'll be teaching this coming semester storyboarding. So, what would be your best advice about you know teaching, giving them guidance on storyboarding? So, story storyboarding, I believe, is the hardest job in animation <laughs> uh, because you're kind of directing the movie at that point, uh, and you're directing the version of the movie. And I think storyboarding is, is where the most work is because it's the hardest job. So every TV show has the most storyboard artist. Every movie has a pretty large storyboard uh, team. Most directors today come from storyboarding. Most show creators today come from storyboarding. So I think it's, it's really, really important. I would encourage any storyboarding students to follow storyboard artists. Watch movies you love or TV shows you love. Look at the credits and start following those people on Twitter and Instagram and see their boards in action and see how they do things. Uh, I, I also believe storyboarding, when you see those animatics, you basically start seeing what, what the thing will be before production happens. And I think storyboarding really is that tool that visualizes things. My only worry with storyboarding is uh, the boards I'm seeing now are animated. And I think a lot of storyboard artists are, are boarding so much. And they're, you know, they're giving 40 hours a week, and they're spending 90 hours a week. And they're killing themselves. And people are getting sick and getting hurt with their hands. And they, they're, they're setting very unrealistic versions of storyboards. And when you look at older films, and you look at the storyboards, 
they're not doing 72 poses. Uh, they're doing one drawing or maybe two drawings and a hookup. So I think storyboarding, we're at a point now where either they need to pay storyboard artists more or they need to open the schedule more because the boards are getting more and more elaborate. But it really is where directors and showrunners are coming from. Hello. Hello. Lourdes. Here. Lourdes. Hey. I went to school with Lourdes. We went to school. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I was a witness. He <laughs> did work a lot. <laughs> he would uh, wrap uh, the walls and paint all over them. When there, were <laughs> as, there was no paper around and there, your same uh, drawings were so proud. Um, I have a question. I've been working as a producer since, um, since school. And you were mentioning that animators are procrastinators. And uh, it's also been said that animators are shy actors. And I found that this is one of the traits in which you find um, a high percentage of people that have some sort of um, special gift. Yeah. You know? so, uh, there's a lot of people that, um, and, and they're true geniuses. Some people lack um, social skills. Some of them are hyper-focused and then procrastinators. How um, can producers and production teams and professors encourage these kids or these artists when you have them on a team? Wow, that's a great question. So I was diagnosed uh, autistic when I was uh, 40, 40 years old. Uh, and the reason I was diagnosed was because when my son was uh, very little, when he was two and a half, and he was diagnosed, my parents in Mexico said, what? He can't be autistic. He's exactly like you at that age. So that's when I started getting tested. And then sure enough, I found out what, I'm, what my spectrum, you know, everybody's different on the spectrum, and what I'm good at and what I'm bad at. And sure enough, at that moment, I realized, oh, I've been studying people my whole life. And I've been, you know, it's great for animation. Uh, I've been mimicking people. And I started realizing, wait, rewatching the same movie five times in a row is not normal? I thought all animators did stuff like that. Uh, and then I started to realize, wow, I think 50%, this is my estimate, 50% of people in animation that I've worked with are on the spectrum. They've just never been diagnosed. Uh, most directors I know are probably on the spectrum. Uh, some, are, some are aware that they are, but they don't want to publicly say it. Uh, I publicly say it because at this point, who fucking cares, right? Like, it doesn't really matter. But early on, I remember my reps telling me, don't tell anybody. Don't out yourself. It's just another reason for people to not hire you. And I remember thinking at the time, if someone doesn't want to hire me because I'm autistic, fuck them. I don't want to work with them. Uh, so I talk about it all the time. What I, on, as a you know, supervisor and as a director and an executive producer, when I meet talent that I feel are uh, different or have, have a different uh, you know, me mental uh, way of thinking, those, were, those usually are where the crazier, most daring ideas come from. They never come from the, the street thinkers. They never come from the, the conservatives. So working with talent like that, I think, is very unique. It's very, it's very um, you have to kind of build a support system around them. And you have to kind of have to be very aware of their mental health sustainability. Uh, and I definitely think most of the work you guys see that is very different, that came from an unexpected place, more than likely that person is ADHD or on the spectrum somehow. Because when, when you get diagnosed, you get told, your brain works differently. You think differently. Well, guess who makes those leaps in the art form? People who think differently, right? And especially when you're thinking ahead, and everybody's thinking about one thing, and you're already thinking about something else, that's really difficult. So yeah, I think for a, for a producer, for, for, for a production, em, enabling that talent to be risky and take risks and have consequences that don't hurt their job allows them to keep experimenting and keep daring and keep doing things to see if something can move forward. So a movie like Spider-Verse, that's what they had. They let the talent go and say, there's no mistakes, try things. And then we'll, we'll grab the things that we think work the best. Most studios could never do that, right? That doesn't fit in a worksheet. So it takes a special, special budget and a special talent to do that stuff. Because it all comes down to money, right? And no, no producer ever wants to be told, we're going to spend money, but it might not work. Thank you. 
Hello, uh, Hello. I'm Saidu, I'm from Martinique, French Caribbean island. I, I created a school, animation school there. And I had a question about your designs. They are very, you know, I don't know how to describe them, very different, very singular. <laughs> uh, uh, my uh, wife says they're drunk. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and definitely my question is, uh, first, what, what's your inspiration and how did you get there? You know, I, I'm curious to you know the process do, do you feel like, okay, this is my style? Or is, that, is there a, a perpetual evolution? Or, you know, wh when, when do, you, do you feel like, okay, I'm okay with this design? And when did that all the process started? Uh, I don't know yeah, if you yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a terrible example of this because I was taught to draw in my head, right? So I, I worked under this guy named Maurice Noble, who was a genius. And he would go, all right, you need to design, you know, for example, a wolf. So go to the library, look at wolf, <laughs> back in the day, right? Go to the library, look at wolves. Look at wolf designs, look at wolves in movies, look at wolves for one day. Then the next day, don't look at anything. And whatever that first wolf drawing is, that's the wolf. You took all the, all the research and whatever stuck to your head, that's the impression of the thing. So now when I draw, I basically go, all right, I'm gonna do a uh, gladiator. And I look at gladiator stuff, I look at blah, 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 and then I put it all away and have lunch or eat, come back, and I go, whatever comes out, that's the gladiator. So I don't do iterations, I don't explore. I'm just a one design guy, <laughs> which drives some people crazy, uh, but that's how I work. And when I work with other designers, I go, don't show me 20 or 10 versions of a design. Because all that time you spent, we could have spent it on other things. Show me one. Show me the one that you like. And so I don't like iterations. <laughs> and, and so when I draw, you know, my style is basically what I've been doing my whole life. And you grab all the things you love, and you avoid all the things you don't like. So when I met Mike Mignola, the guy who does Hellboy, I told him, oh, Mike. I love that your characters are always coming out of the dark so you never see the backgrounds, and they're always standing in weird places and you never see their feet. Uh, it's so evocative and cinematic and, and profound, this idea that there's mystery everywhere. And he goes, hey, dumbass, I don't like to draw feet, and I don't like to draw backgrounds. <laughs> so again, your style is what you love and also what you don't like. So I think style, when people go, oh, how do I develop my style? Working. Your style finds you working. And after a while, you start seeing your stuff, and you're like, oh, I guess this is the stuff I'm into. But character design is such a specific thing, because in feature animation especially, I would look at the, the main characters in movies, and I would go, why are they the most boring character in the lineup? And the reason is the main characters usually have to go through head of animation, head of modeling, head of texturing, head of rigging, head of effect, like everybody has their say. So by the time that design has gone through every department, it's the most generic, safe version. So they can act the most, be lit really well, uh, move really well. So it takes the director being a designer to go, this is my character. If anybody changes it, I will kill you. <laughs> and that, that's how my stuff gets to live, and that's how Sandra's stuff gets to survive. But I think it comes down to the director. And a lot of directors don't design, so it's kind of crazy. Uh, hello, I'm Milos. I'm an animation student. And I've also been getting into uh, writing. And you said for character designs, you try to take the first sketch and make that like kind of the final version. Do you have like a similar process for writing? Because I personally struggle a lot with like planning ahead and actually like having an outline and everything like that. So do you more like do things spontaneously or are you like the, the architect kind of like writer where you plan everything and then you actually write it? I, w I wish I could do that with writing, but it's the opposite. I, um, I write a bazillion versions and a lot of times not by choice. It's because the studio wants, uh, you know, they give you notes and so you work back and forth with them. But I, I think writing for me is the thing I hate the most. Uh, writing is really difficult for me. English is not my first language. So writing in English, I was a C, I was a shitty student. Uh, but the macho thing would be to avoid writing. The super macho thing was I'm gonna get good at writing and I'm gonna embrace this really difficult thing. And the irony of our medium in animation 
is as much as we artists love the look and the visuals, the true power is in the scripts, especially in Hollywood and especially in the money. So if you are not a writer, you are going to struggle. And you look at you know the Brad Birds and the Chris and Phils and Miyazaki, all the people who write and direct control their future because you don't have to wait for a writer. You just do it yourself. So I think writing is, is it's insane to me that animation schools don't teach screenwriting because that's fundamental to what we do. So I had to learn it on the, on the side. And the way I learned writing was I did it for free and would show it to professionals. So for, I'll give you the example, Book of Life. Uh, they said, you've never written a movie. Why should we pay you to see if you can write the movie? And I said, all right, I'll make a deal with you. I will write Book of Life, the movie, for free. And if you like it, you're going to have to pay me double. So I will always bet on me. And if they didn't like it, that movie doesn't get made, so I still win. Right? But you always put it on you. So writing is so important. So like I said, I hate writing. I love having written. The big switch in my head that happened was when I realized you can draw and paint with words. And when you describe a drawing to somebody or when you describe a painting with, to somebody, you're basically painting with words. All right, we have four minutes and 40 seconds. Oh, one last question. Hola, Jorge. Hola. Hi. I'm also from Mexico, I'm from Guadalajara. <laughs> um, and what I want to ask is, sometimes I feel stuck and try to do things that I think others will like, like you did, uh, or that I think will get, will be better received. But then I feel stuck, and um, then I get like depression. Oh, and no. I love telling stories and making comics, but I started to lose interest and motivation. So I took time to ask myself what it is that makes me like what I do. Uh, so I started, I started growing plants, watching movies, uh, painting watercolor, uh, painting pots. Uh, I feel like this is similar to your time painting murals in canvas. So what I want to ask is, how is it that you manage to let your voice be heard in every media that you choose? And how do you keep yourself from drowning in the process? Wow, that's a <laughs> deep last question. Uh, all right, so I believe there's two types of artists. Obviously, there's more types, but I believe there's only two types of artists. Artists who pursue the carrot of success, right? I'm gonna chase this thing and if I get it, I will get money, I will get the admiration of my peers, the respect of my, you know, people I admire, blah, blah, blah. And then there's artists like me who are not chasing success I'm ch running away from failure, right? So there's a monster of failure behind all of us. So what I do is just dangerous. This is bad advice, but it worked for me. So what I do is I use the negative to motivate me. So I yell at the guy chasing me, and I make fun of his mother, and I, inst and I throw you know, rocks at it, so it chases me more. And I go, if I don't do this, I will have let down my father, I will have let down my grandfather, my mom, I will let down my son, my wife, my culture, every single person who believed in me. Every single person who thought, I couldn't do this, I'm gonna prove them right, fuck that. I'm gonna use this negative, negative thing to fuel me to be positive. And when you do that, there's endless fuel behind you. So that's what I do. And I take time to rest, and I take time to fuck around, and I take time to recover, but the work is the work. And for me, again, another switch that happened was I can't put merit on the completion of something. I have to put merit on the process. So if you love the journey and you tr teach yourself to love the journey, then you're going to be happy most of the time. And when you finish, it doesn't matter. If it's successful, people like it or don't like it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you enjoy the process and you work with people you love and you grew. So that's why I always say, when my things don't go, wow, you paid me to get better. 
when they canceled El Tigre, Sandra's still angry at Nickelodeon. At the time, I remember smiling and going, oh, thank you for spending $24 million on our idea. I can't wait to see what we do next. And the person who told us was like, what? <laughs> That's the first time ever has reacted positively to this. So think about my, you know, what I just showed you guys. If my internet cartoon hadn't been canceled, no El Tigre. If El Tigre hadn't been canceled, no Book of Life. If Book of Life had never happened, no crazy Netflix overall deal to make my end of three and everything I'm making. So every failure has brought an opportunity. So take all my advice, you know, all my dead fucking children and build, build ladders from that. And that's why I like to pass on all these stories. You guys are the next generation. Learn from us, take all the stuff that we done and go, lesson, lesson, okay, I won't do what he did. <laughs> I'll do something better. But in your darkest time, just remember, every single one of us have been where you are. Right? Every director you guys know, every show creator you guys know, was a student at one point. They graduated, they were terrified. That's normal. Losing your job, I remember thinking, it's the end of the world. I now lost 30 jobs. You just get better. So you just have to stick to it. Persistence is more important than talent. And it's been proven a thousand times. And I also think if you help others, and you do the, the, the golden rule, if you help those who can't help you, it will come back to you in a good way. So you're, you're going to make it. You're going to be OK. Thank you, guys. <laughs>